Jimmy Dunner and you're watching Without Your Head. I remember when you did an Indiegogo on this, right? No, no I didn't. Yeah. I remember though when you first announced the film, and it seems like the turnaround time from when I first heard about it online to when that finished film got submitted was remarkably fast. Yes. It was very speedy. Uh, yeah, we, we decided, okay, sure. We, um, it's a much longer story. The short version is we decided we were going to sh make this movie, I think last October, we finally decided, it's maybe September or October, uh, and then we were doing rewrites on the scripts, and then in December we shot, and by May we had a movie that you, you probably saw at that point, so um, I don't know how many months that is, but not a lot. <laughs> it's, it's an interesting process when, we, when we're going through films, because first we, we watch it on a small screen, you know, do a film for a freeway submission, or if we get a private link. Then we wait for the Blu-rays to come in, and we double-check it, and that's what I watched just the other night. And then seeing it on the big screen, and I even noticed on the Blu-ray just how striking the colors were in this film. And Blood of the Tribes had that very distinct Euro look. So, I mean, really, two films that look completely different. And I'm just wondering if this, if right away this was a conscious decision to do a film as different from Blood of the Tribe as possible. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think we never want to make the same, same film choice because we love like all sorts of genre films. Um, but this one ended up being super bright, which I like actually. Like, it's just a very bright movie. Um, so it's not, colored film. Yeah, it's not so horry in that sense, except for like the stalkery scenes. Um, so yeah, I mean, I don't know. Trivis was like a very, like we're going after a very specific niche look, and this one doesn't really have like, we're not going after something specific. Right. It's just kind of how we decided to shoot, I guess. Even aside from, from just the visuals though, I mean, the whole film is just super contemporary. And like in the beginning, when we first, when you first do the, the rapid fire edits and fast motion and stuff, it's got a real punk rock feeling. And then it's, it's got the more romantic feeling at the end once it gets more serious. What was there, uh, uh, conscious decision to try and do something more contemporary that wouldn't maybe limit the, the appeal of the film. Like you knew Tribe Aids had a very like you said, specific <laughs> audience. And if I got remember when I watched it the first time, and, I, and that's how we became Facebook friends, yeah. I said, okay, I'm, I'm going to show a film that I may be the only one who likes, <laughs> but I want to show it. And as it turned out, I mean, a similar size audience to this, and everyone loved it, and everyone's following what you're doing now. So I. I did the film end up uh, panning out for you? I know there were all sorts of issues with, yeah. with Amazon. And we got it back on Amazon, so it's on Prime. <laughs> you can watch it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I'm really proud of Trivets. I mean, it, it actually did. We were shocked. Yeah. It did well, and we were shocked because we thought, like, this is a film for the 20 people who are familiar with, like, Roland films and, and Hammer films and all that stuff. And um, a wider group of people seem to enjoy it for some reason. So it's kind of like gothic horror too. So like if you're familiar with any sort of gothic horror, even if you don't know like the twenty films we're specifically referencing, I think mean, you can get a feel for it. And vampires are so ubiquitous, so it's it's easy. And we decided to make a more normal film for this one, and then totally fucked it up. Yeah, well, like all the two strewl stuff was like mostly in post. <laughs> so I mean, like on set, like okay, two strewl started off as just a prop that I made for breakfast because I was like, I need to eat something, so we'll make our own prop. And then like the actors kind of went crazy with it on set, and so like we filmed like a couple of things like not even that well, and then we're just like, well, that has to go in the movie, <laughs> just because they were like improving with it. Um, and then as we were doing the editing, we shot the infomercial and we shot some more little pickup scenes with the two strills because it kind of became a funny thing. But none of that is in the script. And so it got more and more ridiculous as like we allowed ourselves to like, because I think we kind of want to make a somewhat normal movie to try to like, you know, reach a larger audience, I guess. And then it just kind of turned into this madness. <laughs> I, I also, I mean, thematically, we just wanted it to be about um, how it, all of the social media stuff is really just about selling some product and the dumbest possible product is a toaster pastry. So, um, and, you know, we were trying to figure out how do we like reinforce the idea that this is all about some like ads or, or something. We thought about putting ads in the movie, or, you know, just like pop up things or something. Uh, but we didn't want it to look like you were just watching a computer screen the whole time. We we're trying to avoid that. So we decided to do these two strudel things um, and added that the competition so that each of the characters was making a two strudel ad. And that way, we we ended up cutting some of the back the other characterization stuff for some of the side characters, and we're like, let's just let them do this 
like here's their weird presentation of what they would do as a two serial commercial, and that's how you learn about them. That's kind of all. So that's kind of how it went. How it developed. Yeah, it has a very uh, West Coast feeling. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely the goal, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, this is our first, we moved to LA two years ago, so I think when we showed Blow the Trimmers, we had just gotten there like that month, and we flew here. Um, so, yeah, it definitely was born out of like, now we're in LA, so let's make a Hollywood movie. And we shot like all in Hollywood, don't tell anybody without permits. So, like, we just went and grilled it, and nobody stopped us. Um, but a very, very small crew. Um, so yeah, it definitely has that, like, all right, now we're in it, you <laughs> feel, you just drive around shooting palm trees and stuff. Oh yeah, all that stuff on, well, I don't know what the area is, but where you yeah. have the oh, yeah. statue and stuff, yeah. stuff look cool. And how, how did you achieve the stuff where in the foreground she sped up, but the statue's moving in regular time? Uh, it's, it's not in post. No, it's just it just worked out that like they the statue's doing weird stuff, so it kind of like looks it looks very was she super slow. Yeah. The statue moves slowly. Yeah, so so it works out cool. Like I was playing around with how do we because like, we were trying to figure out at one point we we actually shot with sound all that Hollywood stuff. And we're like probably not going to do like a boring. It's all improv too. So it was improv. Yeah, and we were trying to get because you know a lot of these it would be easy for this movie to be like here's 20 videos of what Belly does as a vlogger, but. We we wanted to just show it really quickly as one thing, and, and we wanted to show it was like the most mundane, stupid thing, like not that interesting, so you don't want to watch that over and over again, so we're like, we'll just show it once, we'll show it in sort of time lapse -y kind of way, so that you get a feel for like, oh, okay, it's this kind of dumb internet stuff that, I don't know why people care about it, but they do, and, um, and then we've established kind of like what she's doing and how that fits in the world, and then we can ignore what her videos are like otherwise. <laughs> and it allowed you to have some really fast music. It did, yeah. and, and uh, that's Sophia singing that song, and she, and she basically wrote like a little punk, Hollywood punk song for that. Yeah, 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 yeah. that's half a song. Oh, we didn't bother to write the other half. <laughs> now, the main credits you guys have in this sharing producer and director, was that the case on Private's? Yeah, yeah. so far in all of them. Yeah. How does that work, the collaboration? I mean, co producing and co directing, because you can't go to the producer to complain <laughs> about the co director. No. We do. <laughs> we complain a lot. Um, well, like on Trivets, it was more like we did everything, every detail together. And on this one, it was more I handle all the tech stuff and the crew. And Michael got to concentrate more on the actors and the acting. Um, and I did most of the pre-production. He did most of the post-production. That's kind of how it usually breaks down for our stuff. Um, so yeah, so it's just kind of, we split it up in different ways, I think. Uh, that's pretty interesting, the, the pre and the post. Yeah, I don't want to sit in front of a computer for three months. <laughs> <Well>. <laughs> Also, I went and worked while he was. She was working while I was, just so we could pay the rent while I spent yeah. three months editing. But um, no, you you contribute to post. Don't say okay. that because you know I'll I'll do a cut and then she watches it and yeah, tells me what is it. wrong with it, which is always correct. Um, and usually, sure. and usually what she finds that's wrong with it is because that I was trying to cover up some problem or something. So, yeah. but anyway. <laughs> now we've uh, we've done, we've talked about it on Facebook and in person now. But right. We must for the audience get into the split day after. For anyone who doesn't know, Split Day After is a special lens that allows the foreground and the background to stay in perfect focus. Brian De Palma uses this a lot. That's what the, the key shot in the poster in this film is, and, and you do see it in the film where the main character is talking to the camera and her roommate's behind her talking. Um, but it took, I thought it was a digital trick. And I, the reason I thought that was that uh, on the left side of, the, of her, the background's out of focus, but on the right side of her, everything's sharp. So the Split Day After only does half the, the screen, I guess. Yeah, it's actually a piece of glass that you put in front of the lens, so it's just in a half circle. So for that half, it changes the focal distance. So, and it's very exact, so like the lengths, like we had to put them in place to where, like you know, how far away they could be, and then they could not move from those positions, otherwise they would just go out. Um, so everything that's like, Bailey is the one that's in front of the focal, the glass. And um, so she's like in focus up close, and then you have the background in focus. But then everything on her side is all booked out because that's all out of focus in, in the back now. Um, and usually when they use this kind of stuff, like in the 70s, it'd be like a very dark shot usually when I see it. It's like nighttime or whatever. You don't really see right. as much of that. But again, because this movie's so bright, you see in the middle, you, you know, you can kind of see the line once you see it um, of where it is. But it just looks weird. And we could have composited it, but we did it in camera. <laughs> so is that your lens? Yeah, it's it's just a, it's an adapter. It's a piece of glass that's a half glass. So you put it on, uh, you know, fit, we have different fittings for different lenses, but it's a yeah, it's just a half piece of glass that goes in front of it, and it just changes the focal length. And um, 
part of it is like, you know, the opening, I don't know if anybody noticed in the opening shot that it was a weird, that it felt weird or it was a different thing they're used to seeing, but like, um, you always want to open the movie with something that feels like you're establishing some kind of storytelling, I think. I mean, that's, I don't know, that's how I always... We didn't want to cut, we wanted to do it as a one and that's the only way to keep them both in focus. Right, because yeah. I, I hate the rack back and forth, yeah. yeah. But we also wanted to, I mean, that shot there, uh, Bailey's looking out at the audience, um, at, at the camera, and Emma is kind of like on the side, kind of paying attention to her sometimes and not watching her. We wanted to establish the relationship between the two of them with where they're looking or not looking. And we also wanted to, I mean, the movie is kind of about how we're all, at least my goal with the movie is kind of about how we're all complicit in like, we can hate celebrity culture or fame culture or any of that kind of stuff, but ultimately like it only exists because we're all like clicking on the thing. We're all the ones who are watching it and doing, I mean, somebody's doing it, right? They're getting these, these views. So um, we wanted to establish the beginning, like right away that the audience is kind of involved in that. And that so she, I wanted her like looking, you know, right at, right at us all. Um, like we're, we're kind of engaged in that rather than it being like the two characters talking to each other. So that was, we hope to establish all that in like, you know, this one, the actors were mad. one image. The actors were mad because there are no cuts. <laughs> and she had to cry and she, you know, you, you can only cry a couple of times. Yeah. so many times. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and at what point in development or pre-production did you decide you had to have that shot? In the script. Yeah, yeah, my yeah I, I was like, I want the opening, because I was really thinking about, like I said, the opening, how do we establish these two characters, how do we establish the themes of what I see, and that was, that was like what I envisioned as the thing, um, we bought the adapter to, to shoot, to take that shot, yeah. So. I had a, a film theory teacher in college who said you never see a film, really, until you see it the second time, you don't begin seeing it until the second time. And I didn't even notice that shot until I watched it the second time on the TV. It's just interesting, there are a lot of cinematic, and the statue. I mean, you see it, you kind of register it, but you don't really think about what went into it until the second time you see it. So it's interesting that both films are truly cinematic, but in very different ways. The different well, thank you. Um, were there any tricks to getting the shots in the shower? How was how that? Um, we pre-recorded her dialogue and sped it up and then shot in slow-mo. So, um, and we shot, we had a glass shower, which was amazing at that location. When we saw that location, we're like, all right, it has a giant bay window into the bedroom, which is great. And I had this glass shower, so I'm like, all right, let's rate. Because we knew we didn't want to dream sequences, and we hadn't really planned that out yet. And so we're like, well, now it has to be in the shower. <laughs> we wanted um, to shower originally, too. I mean, that was yeah. in there early. Well, like, we saw that yeah. house, because, like, it's an Airbnb a friend of ours stayed at. And we saw it, and, like, and then we kind of adjusted some things to it. Um, so, yeah, so it's just behind the glass of the shower, and then it's... Yes, yeah, sped up and slow down. <laughs> so the dialogue, it, 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 it's hard because the dialogue is super fast. Yeah, it, was be like, oh, five, oh, oh, oh. it was five times the speed, um, and we shot you know at a high frame rate yeah. so that when you play it back, it's it's slow. But she has to lip sync along to the dialogue at five times the speed of the normal dialogue. Sounds really different. So yeah. it's it is hard, and it was hard to <laughs> sync at the end, and it was it was yeah. it was hard. So it works great, some of it works less great, but I think it, the effect is kind of, you get the idea of it anyway. Yeah, but we wanted that, that feel. We've done a lot of music videos where we did a slow motion lip syncing, same kind of technique where you, if the singer is singing to a sped up track and then you slow it back down to normal, it looks, looks good, so yeah. Right, well, that's sort of what fascinates me about you guys is that you really are sort of total filmmakers and you have all that stuff going on inside. You're doing the, the punk rock documentary, you've got the crowdfunding book. I can just imagine what other things are out there that you got your hands in, but it just seems like you're, you're really knowledgeable about a whole lot of stuff. And, and to me, this is so well produced in terms of all the thinking that went in. I mean, I can see it. All the planning that went into it, and it was probably a fast shooting. Yeah, right? yeah, ten days. Yeah, ten days. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and we didn't, you know, it was it was amazing because we we just had a crew. I mean, we uh, Matt Stewart, who uh, we met here two years ago, actually, is uh, we, we had basically three camera people. Sophia was one of the camera people. Maybe you should talk about this, but um, okay. And Matt Stewart, who we met here two years ago, a great filmmaker and uh, a friend of ours, uh, Paul Zerker. And um, because they're all basically really competent filmmakers on their own. They, we, the crew is just amazing at getting things set up. We just, you know, have a plan for it and they could just knock everything out really quickly and it, we were, you know, it was just that the actors could pull it off. We shot three cameras almost the whole time. Wow. Uh, so we shot 10 days and, and uh, we really didn't go over till the last day. We just, actually that wasn't, because we, we canceled the day because we, we got to the end of the ninth day and we're like, we're almost done. If you all want to stay a couple extra hours and we can finish it, you can 
it paid and staying home tomorrow instead, and so they, they took that up. They took a supplement. I saw Matt's name in the credits on the second viewing, and it meant IMDb to make sure it was. Yeah. <laughs> so Matt yeah. Stewart's directed Tonight She Comes, which yep. is a fantastic horror film we showed either last year or the year before. Yes, two years ago. He also has a previous scene in the movie that was shot later with the two strolls and the dead body from the class. <laughs> he's, the, he's the pink <laughs> Mohawk guy, yeah. yeah. For the two strolls, and it's so creepy. <laughs> That like it exactly matches his personality too. Yes. <laughs> how much of the music did you know you were going to use going in versus how much you created <laughs> like during post? Sure. Yeah. I mean, we. I mean, we knew we were going to score it um, with our friend Catherine Capozzi, who we've done all of our films with, and we uh, have a we have a lot of bands and we've made a lot of songs, you know, in the past. So we have many recordings that we can go to. So we. Catherine and I, mostly, you were involved a little bit, um, sat down and just kind of went through the movie and thought about each scene and decided what, what to use. And we popped in songs where we thought it made sense and we scored the rest. And then that closing song, the whole slow motion sequence, was something that I felt like we couldn't write. And that was um, the very short version of it is, is, is a nightmare to figure out a song that worked for that. I went through many, many, many thousands of songs to try to find something that worked. Finally got that song and I'm really happy with it. So. Yeah. And then Sophia and sang the... the yeah, I started writing the Broken Heart song with Catherine, like when it was dicey if we were going to get the hero song, and like it works way better as an end credit song than it would for that. But we shot that whole scene slow motion, so we're like, it's a music video, basically. We need a really good, like, the one that fits. It's kind of an, an ironic, like it should, that should be in like a Mark Wahlberg movie, you know, because it's like kind of an ironic song to choose for, but I think it works. It, just, it was a pain. So everyone knows, like from a film festival director's point of view, it's a pleasure working with filmmakers like Michael and Sophia because they understand the process that goes into the festivals, they work with the festivals, they travel to the festival. How many have you done for this one? This is about two seven or something. Yeah. And you you guys have already got Distribution. Yeah. Are you able to speak? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, we, we um, I mean, I can even say we signed with this company, ITN, and they're doing sales and distro. Um, and they are, we, we don't have a date yet. It'll probably be like April or May that it comes out, uh, probably on DVD first and then, um, you know, VOD sometime after. And uh, we also just got a, a, a record label deal for the uh, soundtrack for the for the score and soundtrack um, today in the, in the email. So, so we got that going on. And there are two Strudels T-shirts available on Amazon because <laughs> we kept merchandising, right? So in case anybody feels the need to have a two Strudels shirt, that's they're out there. I think we get a dollar for it. Yeah, we, get, we make a dollar each. <laughs> what did they talk about making actual tastes real? Just, just, like, just too much? Too we much wanted money. to like do a really nice job with it, and that cost a lot of money, and we did, just didn't want to half-ass it with like gluing stuff onto like, Pop-Tarts. So a limited edition uh, paste rich. Yeah. <laughs> Signed a number. Who's got questions? Adrian. Uh, yeah, Michael. Very good film. Uh, Thank you. Well, so I, I take, you know, what I got from the film is it was making a statement about social media and stuff. Am I correct? Yes. Sure, yeah. I mean, it's about, what my, my sort of pitch about the film is that it's supposed to be about the impositions of, like, fame culture on average people or young people. Um, and it's, I hope that by the end of the film you, you kind of feel like there's really no antagonist. I mean, the point of the movie was, by the time you get to end, there's really no bad person per se. It's just all these circumstances that are imposed upon them. And so, you know, the end is kind of supposed to be, it's kind of supposed to be comedy and tragedy, I guess, in some sense. That's maybe very bold to try to claim that we, we accomplished that. But, you know, the end is supposed to be sort of tragic that, like, there's this person being killed, um, ultimately because there's this imposition of, of this fame culture on all these people. And, um, that's, that's sad, I don't know. I mean, I think that's, that's supposed to be sad. And ultimately, all of that happens, all of those bad things happen in the uh, service of selling toaster pastries, which is the most important. <laughs> so it's like basically all these lives are ruined uh, in service of selling really dumb products to us. And, and we're, all, we're all part of it, and me, I mean, me, especially me included. So I'm not criticizing anybody else. And yet, I don't think the president comes off too well. <laughs> well, good. Well, okay. When we were looking for masks, we like were like, well, what's the most terrifying mask we can find? And we wanted to do the Michael Myers thing of just painting something white. And so that's what we ended up with. And it's really funny because, like, to me, that's like the the blast manipulation of celebrity culture is like to have that much power. And so it's kind of scary. And then, like, you know, we gag her with 
the red tie. <laughs> so it's, there's like a lot of little things in there that are like, I don't know, kind of. Yeah. I mean, I think it's almost like, honestly, Trump is not even like a person anymore. He's yeah. just this otherworldly force of yeah. things that, you know, whether you like him or not, and I think our politics are clear from the movie, but whether you like him or not, I think it's, I think probably everybody can agree, it's like almost past the point of being a human. It's this weird, like, force, and people are just, they don't even, nobody even listens. To, I, he doesn't even say anything anymore. He just exists as this entity. And he's where he is because of media. It's all fame culture. Right. And so, you know, and um, in Halloween, you know, there's this idea that the Michael Myers is the shape, this force of evil, and we thought like we really wanted because the movie doesn't have an antagonist, we really wanted the idea to be like there's this representation of this imposition of social media as this like force or this entity, and that was why it's really important. You might think there's a lot of stuff in the movie that they're like, oh, those guys are just making putting weird things on the screen, but um, it was really important to us that like those scenes where everybody's wearing the mask and taking it off. That's not just like to trick you, it's really, I mean, our goal with it is really to say, like, every single person in this movie, including Bailey, when you see the, the reflection on her face, is part of this force that's imposed on all these people. So it's like, you know, everybody's the antagonist in the, in the movie, I guess. It's, it, we're, me too, and Sophia as well. Yeah. And you. <laughs> Other questions? For our friends who came all the way from California, Kurt? Uh, I had a couple questions. One, the, there's an amazing slow motion shot of blood dripping into water, and I was wondering, did you actually film that, or was that a stock shot? My other question was um, the very the very last shot where um, where uh, the, the the dark haired character is talking to the camera, and it seems like she's gone crazy, and she's talking about herself from the other characters' point of view. And I was kind of curious what your what your what your thoughts were behind that last scene. Do you want to talk about that? <laughs> you want me to? Okay. I'll button. All right, you button. Uh, we could have shot the water, but it is stuck. Um, there are things you know. Whenever we can find stock that works, that we don't have to shoot something, we're just like, don't bother shooting it. Use the stock. Um, for the end scene, it, it, the whole movie is actually really about Emma, the dark-haired character, um, more than it, you know, we sort of try to trick you into thinking it's about Bailey and it's about her journey, but she doesn't really change in the movie very much. Um, and Emma really goes through a transformation, and that's why, you know, the end in the scene, in the slow motion scene, she does all the things that she couldn't do earlier in the movie, you know, like the pulling out the organs, stabbing with the knife, all, driving, all the stuff that earlier in the movie was a problem for her. So she's made a complete transformation. So in the end, we wanted to do like the, the dark world doppelganger version. She gives the same speech as what Bailey gives in the beginning in Hollywood. And we uh, shot it at night so that it looks, you know, it's like the dark version of that. And she basically is supposed to be, it's creepy. I mean, it's supposed to be creepy because it's like the, evil variation of that. Even I mean, maybe the original was evil too, I don't know, but it is supposed to be like explicitly or symbolically the evil, you know, presentation of that, that whole thing. So I'm glad you sort of saw it that way because that's, that's definitely the goal. Um, well, also like, in our minds, she doesn't know ever that she didn't kill a guy that kidnapped Bailey. Right. Like, you know, so like, she just kind of gets away with this murder because like, nobody actually knows because like, there's so much evidence, you know, that he actually kidnapped her and was going to hurt her and then she's the hero and like, it kind of totally warps her into that. And that's supposed to be actually post credits, but we moved it because everybody cuts the credits off and we're like, no, it's important that people see it. So we're going to move it back for the and the release. release. Yeah. It'll be after all the credits. Yeah. It almost, it almost seemed like it almost made me think of Fight Club, like, you know, I made me yeah. wonder, was the blonde girl her sort of all that oh. glamorous alter ego? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's not, not not literally in the film, but yes, I mean, that's, we, we, I mean, the doppelganger idea is there, right, and all this stuff, and she talks about it, it definitely is the, the intention that this, like, there's these two components. It's not like literally they're the same person in our in our movie, but it, there are these two components, and then you see the, like, the flip of them through the course of the movie. So yeah, I mean, it is. The idea is like, Bailey's totally traumatized after this, because she like set this whole thing up, and then it's like, ends disastrously, and she can't tell Emma. <laughs> I was gonna say, for a film that's not a gore fest, the blood that is there is very pretty blood. <laughs> it's got like a trippy face please. Spilled it all the way to the gallon blood, and we're like, you're crazy. Frank Limber. I just got a question about Emma at the end there. Uh, when she cuts up the, the cop, 
guy. Um, she had pulls his entrails out, plays with them, takes the heart out, starts rubbing it on her face. Why is she doing that? <laughs> That's not what you would do. Uh, no, I mean we're just trying to show the full transformation of her from a character who like couldn't even look at the you know fainted uh, from looking at the thing. Uh, into somebody who's like so because the, the end scene again, and, you know, it has this this music that says like they're the heroes, they're running into battle, they're doing this thing. So we really wanted to establish like this is her saving her friend. Like you know, she's has no longer has any inhibitions. She's just doing you know this. She goes absolutely like crazy into it to be heroic in this moment, and um, that was what we thought was the best like visual presentation of of both the heroism and the transformation from somebody who's like timid about all this stuff and afraid to like live in any way into somebody who's just like dives, dives maybe a little too far <laughs> into it, right? They made a point. Yeah. <laughs> that was the easiest thing we got Brandy to do. We were like, okay, now you're going to do this. And she just went like, 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 She loved it a little too much. Because <laughs> this kind of made me think about there's that sort of idea that if you, you uh, warriors would fight and you eat your <laughs> person's heart, you right. gain their strength. Yeah. So... Right. Speaking of social media and audience participation, is voting live on the IMDb? Page? It is, I think. Yeah. Uh, no, it's, it's not. not, it's not, it's not, not. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So look for the release date. Or for like, wait, uh, as far as you know, they're going to keep the same title. As far as you know. So far, yeah. I mean, we, 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 they can do whatever they want. I'm sure the artwork, the artwork will have some violent images of horror things that aren't in the movie, and um, probably Obama. Obama. <laughs> It depends on the region. <laughs> but please rate all the films that you see if they're available on IMDb. It really helps uh, filmmakers as far as dis distribution goes. So I want to thank both Sophia and Michael for coming out, for being part of the festival. To come out here. Good luck to you guys. And uh, what is next? We're probably shooting like a very no, like literally no budget movie in February just to keep shooting. Um, <laughs> it's gonna be like very underground, like experimental Jindarmushi kind of weirdness, one night thing. And then we're trying to get a little bit of a budget together so we can work with some SAG actors because we haven't done SAG yet um, for the summer. So that'll be like a psychological Rosemary's Baby type thing. Cool. Uh, you should engage both of them when you see them outside. They both have a lot of other projects to talk about. For those of you who are interested in crowdfunding, Michael has a book. Um, thank you so much, guys. Thanks for yeah, having thanks us. For watching uh, it. Yeah, and thank you all for watching our weird movie. And <laughs>